Gather the Children Chronicles of the Maka, Book 2 By Mary Collier Narrated by Benjamin Fife To my beloved Lanny D., who wanted to see how that young man turned out. Prologue. Toma the Justine stared at his controls and the rushing water below in horror and disbelief. What had happened in the intervening 124 years? He was on the third planet from a star the main civilizations called the Earth and the Sun. When he landed, it had been the year of our Lord, 1712, in their incorrect reckoning. When he enlarged the cave to hide his ship, the Golden One, the terrain was stable, and there were no people to discover it. Homes, small cities, and what the inhabitants called settlements now dotted both sides of a wide, flowing river. All types of river craft plied the water below. He checked and rechecked his coordinates. They were as correct as the first time, second time, third time, and fourth time he had run them. If he let himself be seen while trying to find his ship, capable of carrying him back to his world, someone on this planet would surely see his scouting craft. There was also the unpleasant fact that this exploratory craft did not possess the necessary power to extract the larger vessel wherever it was. He could dive again, but it would be futile. He had found nothing below the surface but fish, logs, rocks, and bits of sunken debris from the river traffic that moved along this great channel called the Mississippi. He desperately needed to find a place less populated to hide his craft containing information he had gathered about this planet and its various peoples, information encoded on crystals for further study and extrapolation. Toma knew of one other place on this continent that had not shown any evidence of seismic activity. If he fled back to the more civilized continents, the population numbers increased the risk of his craft being discovered long before any rescue ship from his own planet would search for him or find him. Like many on this continent, he fled to the area known as Texas. He buried his craft far from the sight of man, he would need to live out his life among these primitive beings that valued golden metal, land, and social position above the welfare of their like beings, and many disdained those who sought knowledge. It was a bitter, bitter end to his quest. Chapter 1 Lorenz Hey, Marshal! Better come right quick! Some kid's hauling in a dead man! Zeke Colley stuck his head in the office long enough to yell and then yanked his head back through the door, like a turtle retreating into its shell. Town Marshal Franklin sighed and put down the rattan fan he'd been using to create a futile breeze and shoo the flies. He straightened, brushed the dust from his worsted brown jacket, and jammed his hat over white locks. At fifty-five, he was old for his job in Arles, Texas, and he knew it. 1865 had not been a kind year. There had been riots in Houston and Galveston, hungry people fighting for supplies. Once there had been only hardened adventurers passing through his town. Indians and Comancheros might cause concerns, but they remained well outside the town limits. Now he dealt with men who were probably jayhawkers, night riders, or redlegs. There were bands of hungry, angry men coming home from the war, Men coming home to a home no longer there. Not content to let matters alone, Congress was considering a Reconstruction Bill. Franklin stepped into bright June sunshine and stood alongside the others gathering around some kid on an old dapple gray horse. The kid was leading a gaunt roan with a body wrapped in a tarp and draped over its swayed back. The boy sat rod straight, Henry rifle ready body tensed, his lips a dead white slash against tan skin. The kid looked ready to shoot if anyone came too close or moved too fast. To ease matters, Franklin pushed his hat back, stepped slowly forward, and asked softly, Well, where did y'all find him? 
The boy's weathered hat covered long, curling black hair that hid most of his features except for glowering gray eyes that raked the crowd. Boy seemed the right term, for there wasn't a beard yet, and at the distance of four feet it was obvious he hadn't bothered with bathing. Franklin felt that the kid wouldn't bother shaving if he didn't wash. The boy fixed hard eyes on him, then on the star, and back to Franklin's face. I didn't find him. I killed him. He's Butch Zale, common chero. There's a five hundred dollar reward and I want it. The voice was cold-edged hard. Franklin was startled. A murmur swelled and flowed through the crowd. We'll need to take a look. Zeke, pull that body down. Zeke didn't like the job. His movements were rough and jerky. God, he's done gut-shot him. Somebody give me a hand. The people were more interested in looking than touching. They watched, but no one moved. When did y'all shoot him? asked Franklin. He had to keep control of the situation. Yesterday morning. I'd been following him. Franklin squinted against the sunshine pelting downward, and was thankful he hadn't had to go after Zale if he and his group had truly been that close. The idea of this kid sneaking up and getting away without a scratch was preposterous. Still, it was best to proceed with caution, as long as the kid sat there ready to blow away anybody that moved wrong. Where did y'all take him? In a gully by the foothills. They thought they was hid. His voice had become a reasonable tenor that wasn't cracking. Franklin revised his estimate. Possibly the kid was about sixteen or seventeen. We'll need details for identification. I heard Rolf is in town. Somebody go find him, commanded Franklin. No need to look, Marshal, came an answer. The crowd parted for two men moving closer. We've been watching. A stream of brown tobacco liquid erupted from between the lips covered by a blonde and graying mustache, expertly missing the bystanders. Rolf, ex-mountain man, sometimes wolf hunter, now a cattle man, still wore his buckskins and moccasins. A bowie knife hung from the waist of his short, blocky frame. The man beside him towered over Rolf and the crowd, his huge, lumbering body swaying almost like a bear. He stood more than a foot taller than Rolf and was equally wide. Unlike Rolf, he wore boots and duck trousers. His dark blue, collarless shirt was covered at the neck by a blue bandana and the wide-brim hat of a cattleman sat square on the large head. Franklin nodded at the two. Take a look and see if it's Zale. Rolf walked over and squatted, peering down at the crumpled form while the big man stopped a few feet from the kid and his rifle, seemingly watching the crowd and its wonderment at the developing tableau with amused brown eyes. The kid was grinding his teeth at the delay, How's he gonna know if and it's Zale? He shot the question at Franklin, but kept shifting his glare between the ex-hunter and his waiting friend. Believe me, assured Franklin, he knows. Rolf stood and nodded to Franklin. That's him. Die down, boy. I couldn't have done it better. He died slow. Rolf's voice was filled with admiration, the blue eyes hard and knowing. Like his friend MacDonald, Rolf was now studying the young man. The boy jerked his gaze back to Franklin. Now, I want that reward. His voice was harsh, and reward came out like reward. Franklin shifted his weight to relieve the pressure on his corns. It don't happen quite that fast. First there are papers to be filled out, then... He stopped as the Henry rifle was pointed directly at him. You son of a bitch! I killed him! It's mine! Franklin stood open-mouthed at the authority ringing in the young voice, the sudden change of language, and the rifle pointed straight at his heart. No one saw the huge companion of Rolf leaping the distance separating them. MacDonald shoved the rifle upward with his right hand and used his left leg to drag the young body down with a thud. Franklin caught the horse and handed the reins to Zeke. 
The boy rolled and went for the revolver at his side, flinging it upward toward the giant when a knee caught him on the chin. With ease, MacDonald reached down and pulled him upright, turning the body and clamping his left arm around the boy. With his right hand, he crunched down on the boy's right hand, extracted the revolver from the boy's suddenly loose grip, and flung it to Rolf. Then he removed the other revolver, ran his hand over the boy's back, and flipped a knife from its hidden sheath. Rolf caught the knife while MacDonald ran his huge hand over the boy's front pockets and pulled out a pocket knife. His boots, Mac! His boots! He's probably got another knife in his left one. Rolf was watching with professional interest. Aye! MacDonald leaned his weight into the skinny body and bent the boy over and tightened his grip. Be still, damn ye, he said mildly enough. He shifted his hold to the right and fished up the knife from the boot sheath. Only then did he release the boy. The kid came up with fists clenched, chest heaving. He gauged the size of the man and his strength and knew he had lost, but rage boiled through him, unreasoning, unrelenting. God damn y'all fucking son of a... A huge hand exploded on one side of his face and then on the other, stopping the flow of words. He stood swaying, dazed, the world heaving, but he would not go down. His eyes cleared and he could feel the silence in the crowd, waiting, wanting more violence. He flicked his tongue to the side of his mouth where blood seeped. Can you hear me now? The voice was low and rumbling with the music of a different tongue. Yeah? Then ye ne'er say such words to me again, nay e'er in the presence of ladies. The boy stared upward and sucked in his breath, partially to finish clearing his mind and partially in wonderment. Where did this big bastard come up with the right to tell him what to say? God, he thought, look at the size of him. It was wonderment and he still didn't have his money. The marshal's voice cut into his thoughts. Thank you all, Mr. MacDonald. Zeke, haul the remains over to Doc Huddleston and get Mr. Mallory over here. I'm right here, Marshal. Mr. Mallory stepped from the crowd. His Justice of the Peace office was next door, and at the first buzz of excitement, he had joined the rest of the onlookers. Fine. I need you all to take a statement from this lad and from Mr. Rolfe. The boy let out his breath, hardly believing what he was hearing. I get my gold? he asked. Franklin gave a wry smile. I'm afraid the government doesn't work quite that swiftly. The boy was puzzled. Why not? There's the bank. He pointed across the street in the general direction of the next block. He doesn't read, thought Franklin to himself, but that was not unusual. The United States government doesn't keep its gold in some town in Texas. It keeps it up north for the Yankees. We have to send the papers to them. Hell, I need the gold. Franklin noted the boy's worn jeans, held up by a frayed rope, his ragged shirt, the sloppy split boots, and sighed inwardly. Damn young fool. Poverty probably explained the chance the kid took going after Zale, except there was the full armory MacDonald had stripped off the youth. That didn't make sense. Of course, weapons were cheap now. Men would sell a prized rifle for a bag of flour. We might as well go inside, he said. Mr. Rolfe, would y'all write down your reasons for recognizing Zale? If y'all can't, Mr. Mallory will, and then y'all can make your mark. Rolfe grinned. What language do you want? Deutsche or English? English, Mr. Rolfe. English will be fine. He turned to the crowd. That's all, folks. The excitement's over for today. He led the way inside, followed by Mallory and Rolf. At the door, he realized that the boy was still standing in the middle of the street, hands clenched, undecided, his felt hat still in the dirt where it landed when MacDonald had slapped him. MacDonald solved the problem. He bent down, lifted the hat, and handed it upward, grinning as he did. He might as well learn the ways of townsmen. The boy slammed the hat on and followed. He could devise no other method to regain the weapons that Rolf and MacDonald carried. 
The gold, he decided, had somehow been lost, but he needed his guns. He did not like stepping into the building. He had avoided buildings for well over a year, and this was certain sure to be another place where people told you what to do and what not to do. Chapter 2 Frontier Law The marshal settled himself behind his desk and drew up another chair for Mallory. As Justice of the Peace, Mallory also functioned as the notary public and the coroner. The latter was a job that he and Doc Huddleston had been sharing for years. Now y'all give your details of what happened this morning to Mr. Mallory, who will write them down, read them back, and then y'all make your marks underneath, he said to the boy. The young man was still defiant, but puzzled by the legalities. Mark, hell, if in y'all mean name, I can write that. That came out as that. Full of surprises, thought Franklin, and turned to Rolf. Rolf put his guns on the shelf over there for now. He motioned toward the built-in cabinet, holding the spare shotguns and rifles. Here's some paper and a pencil. Will that shelf have enough room for y'all to write? We're getting a little crowded for space. He glared at the young blond man peering in the door and recognized young Rolf. Well, no matter, except he didn't like too many people in his office. The space became overheated and stifling. The kid in front of the desk kept shifting his weight, acting like he'd pull some stunt if he dared. So far, no words came from his mouth. The kid was watching MacDonald as he deposited the knives on the shelf with the other hardware. MacDonald turned and folded his arms across his chest, his brown eyes glimmering with secret amusement. He knows men, thought Franklin. He knows the kid would gut-shoot him as quick as he did Zale if he had the chance. He turned his attention to the youth. All right, young man, do y'all have a name? What difference does that make? The words were sullen, angry, and slurred with some type of border draw. Both Mr. Mallory and I need that for the records. He starts the paper out with I, your name, the date, and the rest of what y'all have to say about what happened. Franklin was patient. The boy had his back up, but he did need the information for the county records. What for? The kid was still baffled, and he looked ready to run. At the cabinet shelf, Rolf was busy writing, stopping every so often to look at a word, lick at the end of the pencil, and begin again. MacDonald hadn't moved. He was still watching, his face now intent on the boy's face. Franklin removed his hat and sighed. This was going to take some time. It is necessary because if the government does acknowledge your claim, they need to know who y'all are and where to send the money. What the hell am I supposed to do for eats? I need it now, he glared at Franklin. Kid, Franklin sighed, half of the people in Texas are wondering what to do for eats. First things first, state your name and tell Mr. Mallory how y'all killed Zale, that is, if y'all did kill him. A flush spread over the half-wild face. Franklin noticed the scar that started under the boy's scraggly mane, traversed the length of the right cheek, and slid under the dirty shirt. It was an ugly scar, twisting the mouth upward into a sarcastic grin. Right now the proud flesh was turning purple. The gray eyes were blazing and turning into cold fire. God, thought Franklin, that one kills and probably enjoys it. I killed him and his right-hand man, Travers. The rest ran like coyotes, but two was limping and one sure as hell ain't gonna make it. Fine, replied Franklin. Now just tell Mr. Mallory your name, how y'all came upon them, and exactly what happened out there. He locked his eyes with the boy. Otherwise I might just throw y'all in jail for disturbing my whole morning. The kid pondered that for a minute and shrugged. My name's Lorenz, he gritted out between clenched teeth. And inquired Franklin. Huh? A man generally goes by two names, sometimes more. We need that for the record. First and last name, please. The gray eyes studied him. 
It was not slowness that stayed the boy's tongue. Franklin suspected he was hiding something. The boy shrugged. Some call me Kidlerans. Franklin snapped the fan to hide a smile. Now he recognized the warning twitch in the back of his mind. The name was from an old handbill. What Franklin didn't like was the way MacDonald and Rolf had straightened. The last thing he wanted was trouble from those two. He did not take lightly the tales of MacDonald breaking bones while Rolf carved away with his bowie knife. Right now, he needed to hear what the youth had to say before he brought up the old handbill. Fine, he repeated. Tell Mr. Mallory what happened. MacDonald stepped closer, as if to hear the tale, but Franklin suspected he was studying the boy's features. Rolf seemed to nod and returned to his writing. Franklin slid the bottle of ink over to Mallory and breathed easier as the boy began his recital of following Zale's trail out of Fort Davis, down to Juarez, and back. Franklin kept his eyes on the big man and on Rolf. MacDonald was still looking intently at the kid, and Rolf was still busy, but, damn it, the boy did bear a resemblance to Caspar Schmidt. Quietly, he reached into his bottom drawer to pull out the old handbills, trying to listen and look at the wanted posters without distracting MacDonald. His mind kept worrying about what the big man would do. Should MacDonald decide the kid was his stepson, all hell could break loose. What kind of man married a woman who had been taken by the Comanche, and then goes into court, sues for divorce by declaring her husband guilty of desertion, abandonment of wife and children, and attempted murder? To top it off, Rolf and MacDonald were damned Yankees. They publicly stated to one and all they had given their oath when entering this country, and by God, they'd not break it. Despised the two might be, but here they remained. The town had tried threats and burning them out. When a trio of townsmen attacked MacDonald while he was recovering from a war wound, that crazy woman of his had taken MacDonald's cane and thrashed one assailant as MacDonald dispatched the other two. You'd think the Yankees would have the decency to stay out of town, but Rolf and MacDonald drove in their cattle and sold them to the U.S. Cavalry. They walked and rode where they pleased. Halfway through the handbills, Franklin found what he knew was there. Rolf interrupted his thoughts by laying the paper on his desk and asking, Will that do it? Franklin scanned the writing, still half listening to the boy's recital. The writing was surprisingly crisp and to the point. A neat, up-and-down, slanting script he would not have credited to someone who spoke English as Rolf spoke it. Yes, as soon as Mr. Mallory has time, you can sign in his presence and he'll stamp it replied Franklin in a low voice. The kid stopped talking long enough to glance at them. I snuck up on them during the night. They didn't know I was there, and I waited for dawn's light and gut-shot Zale while he was pissing. The thinking of it brought pleasure to his eyes. Then I shot the others and watched Zale finish dying. He took some time dying, he ended with satisfaction. Then the boy glared at them and clenched his fists, as though daring any of them to dispute his version. In his own drawl, Mallory read back the recital. Is that right? He asked when he finished. I reckon, came the kid's answer. Mallory brought out his seal, inked it, stamped the page, wrote in the date, and then his name with a gothic flourish. All it needs now is your mark right here. He turned the pages and pointed to the correct line where he had applied an X. He handed over the pen and said, Y'all will need to dip the pen again. The youth bent over the paper and brushed the hair back behind his ears, took a deep breath, and grasped the pen. The hand was large and bony, a strong hand showing the strength that would someday come with full growth. He bit at his lip and in printing wrote out L-O- R E N Z, scrawling the letters like a four or five year old child that has just learned to write. He shoved the paper back to Mallory, straightened, and looked at the marshal. If and that's all, I want my guns. Franklin smiled. The lad was ready for a fight. He'd lose, but still he intended to fight. I'm afraid I can't allow that, 
This handbill says that a kid Lawrence is wanted for killing one Patrick O'Neill down in Wooden almost two years ago. You're a bit taller, but y'all were only thirteen then. Says y'all ride with Zale. Y'all didn't find his camp. Y'all were just there. That's why it was so easy for y'all to shoot him, wasn't it? Y'all just blasted away in camp. Why, is that reward sounding good in these days of slim pickings? Like shit! I killed him cause he did this to me. The kid touched the jagged scar, and it killed the woman that raised me. I tried to stop him, and he damn near killed me then. That was most three years back. Besides, that O'Neill bastard was alive when I left. The kid was getting wild-eyed again, about ready to bolt. MacDonald wasn't helping matters, as he had edged forward to occupy the space next to the desk and the kid. Rolf had casually dropped his hands to his waist. Both men worried Franklin. "'Did y'all ride with Zale?' he asked. "'Hell no!' "'But y'all were at O'Neill's, yeah?' Franklin knew why MacDonald and Rolf were ready to fight, and he didn't want it. Not here. This was to be his last job, and he wanted to leave it walking upright. He tried again. Y'all said Mr. O'Neill was alive when y'all left. Do y'all have any proof for anyone to back up your story? Yeah, his kin was with me. Who would that be? Franklin asked the question, but he was watching the huge, looming bulk of MacDonald. Red! Red O'Neill, his pa's brother to that O'Neill, only his pa's worse. Do you know where this Red O'Neill is now? I reckon he's in Carson City. That's where he was going. That presents a problem, began Franklin. From the corner of his eye, he could see MacDonald straighten. The deep voice rumbled out, Marshal, tis that an official handbill, or mayhap one put out by the family. Small towns rarely covered the cost of printing and distributing wanted posters, but a wealthy family would gladly pay for the printing and shipping. Franklin knew he was losing, even though he felt the kid was lying. It's a family one, he admitted, but I'm sure the city of Wooden will concur with the charge. Hell, broke in Rolf in disgust. Wooden and that whole country belong to O'Neill. The kid was startled. He wasn't sure why help was coming from two people he considered his enemies, but it calmed him. Maybe there was a chance of getting out of here. Mayhap you could tell the marshal why ye were in Wooden, suggested MacDonald. I was looking for my folks. We used to live there, out of town a piece. MacDonald smiled. Ay, and your sister, Margaretha. Twas she with ye. Do ye ken where she tis now? The boy stood open-mouthed and bewildered. He ran his eyes over the six-foot-nine, two-hundred-and-ninety-five-pound giant in front of him. His questions had so rattled him that he answered without thinking, She's in Carson City, too. Good gar! Nay with O'Neill! The shocked question exploded. The boy's eyes had hardened again. Who the hell are y'all? I'd sure as hell remember somebody as big. The voice trailed off, and the gray eyes softened for the first time. There was a big man who used to ride me on his shoulders. He looked at MacDonald, emotions pulling at his face. Aye, twas your grandfather. He tis nigh as tall as me. MacDonald turned to the marshal. As you can see, he tis one of the laddies we have been looking for. He twill go home with me, and I twill send a telegram to Mr. O'Neill in Nevada. Ye can find out if there are charges against the laddie, and the town twill nay have to bear the expense of his boarding. And if the handbill is correct, then what? Are y'all bringing him in? asked Marshal Franklin. He had considered the costs, but accommodating MacDonald would not endear him with the citizens. MacDonald regarded the marshal for a moment, and then spoke. "'Tis the word of MacDonald ye have, that I twill be bringing him back. "'Go to hell!' the boy exploded. "'I ain't going nowhere with a bastard like y'all, and as far as this shit in jail—' 
A hard hand clamped down on his shoulder and stopped the tirade while propelling the kid toward the back door. "'It will excuse us, gentlemen. We will be back directly,' stated MacDonald. Franklin could only nod. Rolf grinned and spat. Mallory stared at them bug-eyed. "'And keep Mr. Mallory here for the signing of any papers, if need be.' He shoved Lorenz out the back door and walked him away from the building. Lorenz gave up struggling. He had felt the bones move when he resisted. That grip was worse than rawhide cutting into the skin. Survival was his only credo, and winning a fight against this man wasn't possible. He noted the flat ground, the lumber yard to the left on the next block, and the backs of the buildings on this street. Everything else was open, exposed. No trees, no boulders, no fit place to hide if he ever got loose. It looked like he was going to listen or get belted again. I'll kill him like I did Zale, he thought. Now, he can turn, and we twill speak. The pain left his shoulder, and Lorenz turned. Weren't no women in there, he protested to MacDonald. MacDonald chuckled. Aye, but I'd rather have my say where others are nay hearing, and from now on ye can nay call me those names. The boy was silent as the dark eyes regarded him, taking in the breadth of his shoulders. His head was held high and proud. Gray eyes sparked like flint. The lad had a wide brow, thick dark eyebrows and eyelashes, a straight nose. The lips were a bit thin, set in taut anger, and the cleft in his chin made him a masculine version of his mother. Except for the scar, he tis a likely-looking laddie, thought MacDonald. Do you recall your mother? he asked. Lorenz nodded, and MacDonald continued speaking. The Comanche took your brothers. Have ye seen or heard of them? Lorenz simply glared at the big man. Since this big bastard didn't like the way he talked, he was damned if he was going to say anything. MacDonald sighed. I was a scout over at Fort Davis ere the war. Your mother, twas at one of the Comanche camps, the second dragoons attacked. She twas nigh starved, for she twould nay do things their way, he grinned in remembrance. She tis a stubborn woman. Y'all get her out of there? Curiosity about her well-being forced the words to spill out. Aye, that we did. Then I took her to your eld, er, uncle's place. He twas in Texas searching for ye. There tis a bond twixt twins that nay can break. She's okay, then, Lorenz felt compelled to ask. Inside he was reeling. Uncle, what uncle? He couldn't remember any uncle. And his ma was double-born? Some held that unnatural. Why can't I just go to my ma's and uncle's, then? The words came softly from the big man. You're going home to your mother. Nigh seven years hence, Mrs. Anna Lawrence did me the honor of becoming my wife and counselor. Lorenz felt the sickness rise inside. His ma was married to this lout. God! He looked at MacDonald and knew that within hours he would have the shit beat out of him or worse. No, mustn't think about worse. He had to get away. But to run now was stupid. All he could do was glare at the man and wish him dead. The voice continued, low words rumbling out of the deep chest. We have a wee lassie, but ne'er laddie. There twas one, but he died within a few minutes of birth. Your mother has claimed all these years that ye, Margaretha, and Daniel still lived. He paused to give Lorenz a chance to speak, and when no words came, he continued. From now on, ye will call me Mr. MacDonald, and ye will answer aye, sir, and nay, sir, to my questions. The same holds for when ye speak with Mr. Rolf, or any other man back there. Why? demanded Lawrence. MacDonald leaned backward and smiled down. Because tis one of my rules, and ye twill nay disgrace me, or your mother, with your tongue. What the hell does she have to do with my talking? Dear God, where have ye been? Did your sister nay teach ye about civilized behavior? The boy looked at him and grinned a quick, sardonic slash. If his ma was like that, it was his ticket out, 
MacDonald wouldn't dare take him home. I weren't with Reedy this whole time. Zales Comancheros picked me up and I lived with them for years. I ran away when I was old enough. Y'all can't take someone like me back. Ma doesn't want me anyhow. She wants Daniel. Ye were with Zale? MacDonald was surprised. What of your sister? Do they have her too? Nah, some engine horse came through where we was hiding in the cornfield. Reedy always could ride anything, still can. She got on and rode to O'Neill's place for help. Damn! MacDonald exploded, and he eyed the youth in front of him. Which question should he ask first, and would he receive an honest response? Why did they let a wee laddie like ye live? Ye were nave any use to them. Zale's woman found me. She'd just lost a kid and needed someone to suckle. Zale let her keep me. And what happened to Margaretha? She got to O'Neill's okay, but the bastard locked her up and then sent her to some Catholic nunnery down in San Antonio. So, O'Neill twas lying. I kenned I should have gone with Rolf and Casper. MacDonald clenched his fists. Damn, all these years wasted. Huh? Your Uncle Casper and Mr. Rolf went twice to O'Neill's place, trying to find ye and Margaretha. O'Neill insisted that the Indians had taken your older brother, your mother, and young Augustov, and that ye and your sister were dead. He claimed to have heard rumors that your father had arranged for the attack. He showed them the two graves that supposedly held the dead from the attack, explained MacDonald. It didn't make sense to Rolf and me. Your father had red hair. The Comanche twill avoid a man or woman with red hair. Either he did deal with the Comanche, or he ran. MacDonald looked at Lorenz. Since ye twere with Zale, did ye kill the O'Neill living in Wooden? No, I wanted to, but he had me chained up cause he and his brother figured out who I was when I went looking there for Ma. Red had followed me from Carson City and made him let me loose. And Red said he was taking me back to Reedy, but he got drunk one night and I gave him the slip. Lorenz finished the tale without telling why O'Neill drank too much. To MacDonald, it was an amazement what the lad could tell, and what he must have omitted from the telling. Where was he taking ye? Back to Reedy in Carson City. How did she get there from San Antonio? Red helped her run away from the nunnery. She wound up in Tucson running a bakery. Lorenz figured he'd better leave out the before part about her and Red gambling on the riverboats. How did you get there? Zale was close to there when I ran away, and Reedy recognized me when I was looking for food. Why did you nae stay there? Zale's woman ran away too and was with me in Tucson. She was pregnant again and couldn't take that life no more. Zale followed her and killed her. I tried to stop him, and he did this. Lorenz touched the scar. Reedy had to pay for the doctor to fix me, and to pay for it, she started singing in the saloons. Ye gods! Yeah, so y'all can't tell Mama about Reedy and where she is. Women like Mama pull their skirts away and spit at her if they dast. He looked at MacDonald, his own face flushed with triumph. MacDonald's face showed his words had had their desired effect. MacDonald took a deep breath and continued his questioning. Ye still have nae said why ye both left Tucson. Red was in Carson City cause of the war. He weren't about to get killed, and the South couldn't make him put on a uniform. He needed help with his cat houses and sent for Reedy. She works there? MacDonald's voice sunk to a horrified whisper. If e'er his counselor had reason to hate the O'Neills, she would be in a fury when she heard this tale. Nah, she does his books, but she's got her own gambling place. MacDonald's eyes took on a humorous glint. Somehow it seemed possible. And why did ye nae stay? he asked. Cause Reedy made me mad by whooping me. I just left. I had to get even with Zale, anyway. Tis that why you went looking for your mother first? 
probed the gentle, rumbling voice. Baffled, the boy clamped his lips shut. Now that ye have told your tale, ye can listen to me. We are going back in there and finish our business. Before we do, ye need to ken the rules for the way ye twill be living. He paused, his eyes locking with Lorenz, neither giving way. One. Your name tis Lorenz Adolf Lawrence. Two. Ye twill nay be using vile words to me, your mother, nay any adult. Three. When I give an order, ye do it. But if any of my orders should puzzle ye, ye have the right to ask why, and ye have the right to remind me that I have given ye this right. Ye have the right to learn and to grow, the way the good gar intended. But if ye cross me, I'll drop yer breeches where ye stand, and use a belt on your backside. The boy opened his mouth to protest, but MacDonald cut him off. The first time ye disobey, twill only be five counts with the belt. Each time ye disobey thereafter, I'll increase the count by one. By the time I reach ten, ye had best learn to count. Any questions? By now, anger was surging through Lorenz. He swallowed bitter words mixed with bile. This adversary was too large. He needed time to think, to plot, and to run again. He shook his head to indicate no questions. MacDonald smiled. "'Tis welcome, dear, then, in our hearts and our house. Now, let's go back." Chapter 3 Introduction to Civilization The office was heat-hot from the extra bodies, everyone sitting or standing and waiting for more excitement. Franklin had half hoped Rolf would have taken his grown cub and leave, but no, the Dutchman just stood there, daring any to ask him to leave. Franklin, like most Americans, heard Deutsch as Dutch and rarely made the correct country connection. The boy came in first, face set and jaw tightened. MacDonald had evidently rough broke him. MacDonald nodded at Rolf and the assembled audience, but he spoke directly to Franklin. Are we in agreement that the laddie goes home with me, and I send the telegram to Mr. O'Neill, sparing the country the expense? Franklin would have liked to reject MacDonald's offer. Reality, however, was the small jail he ran had no extra room, and since the South's capitulation, money for rations was non-existent. If the present United States judge found out the gold taken in the robbery and death of O'Neill involved Confederate gold, the man might not consider it a crime at all. All right, MacDonald, but if I found out there is a valid warrant, I'll be out after him. Aye, MacDonald nodded again. Good day, gentlemen. I want my guns. Stubbornness slashed through the voice as Lorenz protested. MacDonald looked at Franklin. We'll take them with us. Rolf picked up the arsenal and moved toward the door. MacDonald clamped his hand down on the boy's shoulder, gently nudging him on his way. Ye are nay to touch a weapon for a while. Lorenz breathed deep and looked longingly at his guns and knives, then shrugged. Outside, they paused for MacDonald to introduce the young man who had stood at the back. Lorenz, this tis young Rolf. Martin tis his given name. Martin, this tis Lorenz, Anna's laddie. Martin extended his hand, blue eyes beaming welcome, and in a firm baritone voice said, Good to finally meet y'all, Lorenz. Startled, Lorenz shook his hand. Martin appeared to be a couple years older than he, a blonde, younger version of Rolf, without the mustache and teeth browned by chewing tobacco. My poisoned me will get some eats. Rolf pointed to young James up on the wagon seat. The wagon was a sturdy rectangle made of fading, once-painted green slabs of wood, and a solid, unimaginative design. Rolf stored the weapons in a locked box in the back of the wagon, and he and Martin climbed aboard. Meet do in front of Stanley's place. Aye, friend Rolf. Lorenz, we go this way. MacDonald waved toward the section of town where the freight station stood. We're gonna walk? Lorenz couldn't believe it. A cattleman walking instead of riding was not natural. He had seen a huge riding horse, one of the two horses tethered to the wagon, and figured it had to be MacDonald's. It was an animal big enough for him. Aye, we twill come back for your horse. Lorenz fell in step rather than be dragged or propelled along. 
There was still no way out, as there were far too many people. And why the hell was Martin glad to meet him? I ain't never going to see that gold, am I? Who cans? May happen a few weeks. Huh. And if and it does come, who gets it, y'all? Nay, twill be yours. Lorenz didn't believe him, but didn't argue. They passed people hurrying to be done with their chores before the midday heat. Women would draw away and wrinkle their noses. Lorenz seemed oblivious to their behavior, but he knew they were afraid of him. Afraid, just like his ma would be when she saw him again. Why the hell was this big bastard taking him there? For Lorenz, it was enough to know that she was alive and safe. Then again, maybe she wasn't safe. Not with this big bastard beating on her. Maybe he should swing by there once he got away. A huge blue star hung over the freighting office, proclaiming to one and all that this was the Blue Star Line. The Blue Star identified the office as the town's reason for being. Men were constantly going in and out, with orders to be filled, teams to be tended, harnesses repaired, the shifting, stacking, and rerouting of trade goods. This part of the country's network of merchandise distribution was as yet undisturbed by railroads. Freight was hauled in from every major point by wagons, mules, and men. The building housed the merchandise, wagons, loading docks, separate quarters of the teams and men, and in the office the indispensable telegraph. Town women had agitated for the telegraph to be moved to a more genteel location, but economics kept the telegraph where it was needed. Hello, Mac, said the man at the desk. He was long, lanky, dark-haired, and mustached. Whatever animosity the town felt towards Yankees, this man didn't. Business was business. Y'all planning to carry your goods home now? Nay hey, now, but in a bit, Andrew. It is your communications I am needing this time. My what? The telegraph, explained MacDonald. I find it is necessary to send two. Ye can get messages to Carson City, Nevada, aye? Sure thing. I heard y'all and Rolf had brought in a herd. Prices any better for beef? Bah! A deep rumble issued from the throat. If we nay had the contract, they would have screwed us as badly as any that wore the grey. As tis the money twill buy beans. Andrew, this tis Lorenz. Lorenz, Mr. Andrew. Andrew nodded at Lorenz, and shoved a piece of paper toward MacDonald. Howdy, young man. Lorenz nodded, and watched MacDonald bend and scrawl lines across the sheet. He finished with a flourish, and looked at Lorenz. Does your sister have an address? Lorenz shook his head. Then what about O'Neill? Does he have an address? He owns the Sporting Palace, or did when I left. MacDonald sighed and shook his head. Andrew, the first goes to Miss Margaretha Lawrence, General Delivery, the other to Mr. Red O'Neill, owner, Sporting Palace. I'll read them back just to make sure there's no error. Andrew's face showed no emotion as he read, Miss Margaretha Lawrence, stop. Lorenz is safe with us, stop. A letter from your mother, Mrs. Anna MacDonald, Nee Schmidt, will follow. Stop. Mother rescued eight years ago. Stop. Zebediah L. MacDonald. Next one, continued Andrew. Mr. Red O'Neill, Sporting Palace. Stop. Marshal Franklin of Arl, Texas, needs your confirmation that Patrick O'Neill was alive when Lorenz left with you two years ago. Stop. Marshal has family poster. Stop. Speed is important. Stop. Zebediah L., etc. Andrew looked at MacDonald. Aye, twill do. That'll be five dollars for the two. Tis dear. MacDonald dug down in his trousers and extracted a coin. At least it gets there, replied Andrew. Y'all going to pick up everything for Schmidt's corner? Nay, just the liquor barrels for friend Rolf and myself. Twill be another hour or so ere we're back, answered MacDonald, and tipped his hat at Andrew. He and Lorenz stepped outside and walked back towards the marshal's office. Lorenz was trying to devise an escape plan. Maybe he could race the man and jump on Dandy and be gone. He tensed. The crowd wasn't much, and Big Man probably couldn't move too fast. If you're thinking of Bolton, dinner, and when we are at the wagon, ye dinner touch your mount. Why? Tis another of my rules. 
Lorenz sulked. The man's rules were becoming tedious. This was just like being with his sister. And how the hell did he know what he had been planning? MacDonald untied the reins and led the way to the wagon now parked in front of the general store called Stanley's Dry Goods and Sundries. The wagon's faded green slabs were hung with water barrels and nose bags. The team of part Morgan and some other lineage stood with heads bowed and tails swishing at the gathering flies. MacDonald tied Dandy's reins to one of the hoops at the back and pulled down on the tailgate, revealing an interior lined with boxes. Now, we'll have a look at your stash. You can take off your saddle and bags, as they'll go in the wagon. You'll be riding with Martin on the seat. Like hell. Laddie, I am being patient. Take off that saddle. MacDonald commanded. Lorenz stared at him. Why can't I ride? Lorenz, if you dinna wish your breeches down in front of all of these people, ye twill do as I have said. MacDonald's R's was rolled into three in his pronunciation. Lorenz yanked at the cinches. Outright rebellion was futile. He would wait for a better time. He half threw, half slammed the saddle onto the wagon bed. MacDonald's eyes glinted, but he knew he had won. Now, let's see what you have. The contents of the saddlebags were slim. There was no food and no tobacco. MacDonald held up a pair of canvas jeans and critically eyed the lad before him. Lorenz flushed. I grew. I would have traded him, but no time. This tis all the clothes you have? That's it. MacDonald shook his head and extracted the remaining items. A thin blanket, a tin plate, and a spoon. The implements he put into the chuck box and left the blanket in the saddlebags. Then he shoved the saddle against the sidewall. Since all the clothes that ye have are on ye, we twill go shopping. Why? I cannot take you back to your mither with nay but those clothes. Lorenz was puzzled, but then realized that his mother was going to have opinions about what he wore similar to Reedy's ideas. MacDonald's voice rumbled on. Walk. He pointed to the doorway in front of them. We ain't eaten. There was real regret in Lorenz's voice. Hi, ere long. The inside of the store offered relief from the sun's gathering strength, but there was no breeze, and the air was beginning to resemble a modern sauna. The smells of pickles, brown earth still clinging to potatoes, coffee, spices, dyes from the few new clothes and polished boots assailed the nose. A slender, balding man of about forty nodded at them. Stanley would have preferred to ignore the huge man, but like the rest of the town, he knew that the damn Yankees had delivered a herd to the cavalry stationed outside the town. If necessary, Captain Richards would enforce the sale. The bile rose in Stanley at the thought of MacDonald and Rolf, two of the few people with cash money in their pockets in June of 1865, walking around and not hung or tarred and feathered. The soothing proclamations of the provisional governor notwithstanding, the war had left the South bereft of valid currency. He knew that both men would buy most of their goods from MacDonald's brother-in-law at Schmidt's Corner. Anything I can do for y'all. His offer was perfunctory, his voice cool and aloof. Amusement lurked in MacDonald's voice as he answered, Aye, the laddie needs a pair of boots. Inside, the big man was shaking with laughter as Stanley's eyes lit up. Plus two pair of socks, as the missus will knit more. No need to raise the man's expectations too high. And a pair of breeches, he concluded. To Lorenz he asked, Do you have a slicker? Lorenz shook his head. Answer and say it right. MacDonald's voice rumbled out at him. Lorenz quit gawking at the meager goods laid out on the table, flushed, threw a baleful glance at the big man, and spat out, No, sir. Mayhap that can wait. It does nay seem ready to rain for a while, but twill need a shirt. Will Mrs. MacDonald be needing any material for new shirts? asked Stanley. A note of expectation crept into his voice. Nay, nee, she still has a bolt from her last shopping trip. However, once we have selected a pair of boots and some clothes, do we'll need a few supplies for the extra mouth. He turned toward the end wall and the rack of boots. They were all crudely made and all the same color, black. The boots were made to fit either foot, and so fit neither. MacDonald had his own boots cobbled as none such as these would fit him. He longed for the day when they could afford a tailor, and his wife would no longer need to make all of his clothes. 
Stanley, ever the salesman, selected two of the boots and handed them to MacDonald with a flourish. Finest pair in town. MacDonald held them alongside one of Lorenz's feet. It was impossible to tell if they would fit or not. Lorenz's current boots were slashed at the side to allow for feet that had outgrown the pair he wore. Lorenz, take off your boots and try these on. He turned to Stanley. You might as well give us a pair of those socks so that each will have them on when we buy the boots. I didn't want the boots to fit without the socks. Stanley raised his eyebrows. Why not? Is he still growing? He was curious as to which of the lost children this one would be. No doubt it will. He is but fifteen, and already he is tall as his mother. Lorenz looked at his stepfather with a puzzled frown. No woman he'd ever seen was that tall except Reedy. He took the socks from Stanley and slowly dragged them on, while searching in his mind for some remembrance of his ma. He remembered her towering over him enraged, gray eyes flashing, her lips drawn in a tight line. Nein, nein, du must not. He must have always had the ability to make people mad. He looked up to see MacDonald ruefully regarding the unclad foot. At least the big bastard didn't say anything about the toenails and dirt clinging everywhere as he hurriedly pulled on the other sock. After comparing the new boots with the old pair, MacDonald asked, Have you grown in the last few months? Lorenz shrugged. Some, I reckon. My shirt got too small and had to... He stopped short and began tugging vigorously on the new boot. No need to tell MacDonald that he'd taken the shirt from someone's clothesline. Instinct told him that MacDonald would want to pay somebody for it, even if the price came out of his own hide. MacDonald watched the fight with the boot and said to Stanley, We best see the next size. This pair proved to be a tad wide, but the selection of sizes had ended. Twill do, sighed MacDonald. Now, we need a shirt and a pair of summer drawers and vest. Lorenz was horrified. I've got to put those on. Hell, it's hot out there. He may need wear them right now. The voice was patient, half amused at his distress. The shirt was blue, rough, and collarless. The cotton drawers and vest were bought a size too large to allow for any growing Lorenz might do. MacDonald added a couple of handkerchiefs, a belt, and then moved toward the counter. Stanley rapidly positioned himself in line with the counter and the shelves to be able to retrieve any item that was ordered. If the man bought enough, Stanley would be able to pay on his account at the Blue Star. Maybe he could even stay in business. On his way to the main counter, MacDonald picked up a doll with brown hair and a fixed smile. And how much is this? he asked, holding it aloft. The doll, like many items in his store, had lain there since the second year of the war. Stanley licked his lips. Two dollars. One. MacDonald's eyes hardened. Stanley nodded. One dollar it is. Damn the man. He always seemed to know what a body would accept in payment. At the counter, Stanley took out his pad to jot down the purchases. We need a pad of paper, lined, and a pencil. MacDonald was consulting a list. And do you happen to have some colored chalk for a wee lassie to do some drawing? Stanley retrieved the items from their respective shelves. Come fall, we'll have some of those in nice wax crayons. He volunteered. Eh, Cap will get them for us. MacDonald could not resist shooting an arrow into the Stanley's pocket of hopes. Now, as to the food, he continued, twill be needing an extra pound of beans, he eyed Lorenz critically. Mayhap ye best make that two pounds, two pounds of flour, and five pounds of potatoes. Do ye have any canned tomatoes left? Not a one, came Stanley's bitter reply. There are a couple of cans of peaches left, though. Aye, we'll take them. Do ye have any condensed milk? Twill go well with the peaches. Certainly. Stanley's voice became brisk and businesslike, and his movements quickened. As he brought the canned goods to the counter, he noticed the boy eyeing the loaves of bread and rolls. Maybe he'd like a roll while we're conducting our transactions, he suggested. MacDonald nodded glumly. He suspected a hollow stomach in that skinny body. Aye, add it to the bill. Lorenz snagged a roll and stuffed it into his mouth. We are nay sure if the dried apples twill be on this shipment to Schmidt's corner, continued MacDonald. Do you have any? 
No, we're completely out, but here, try some of these. Brand new this year, just in from California. He removed a saucer from the top of the cup and handed the cup to MacDonald. I can't keep the flies out of my house, he said, to explain the saucer. They're called raisins, dried grapes, and just as sweet as can be. He didn't add that they were on consignment from growers in California, desperate to get rid of two years of agricultural products. MacDonald's huge fingers barely fit into the cup. He extracted a few of the raisins and warily rolled one on his tongue and bit down. Surprise flooded his face. Tasty! Here, laddie, try some! He dumped the remaining fruit onto the quickly outstretched hand. The raisins went the way of the roll. How do you use them? asked Stanley. Just like any dried fruit, cakes, breads, and pies, answered Stanley. Then twill take a pound. Mrs. MacDonald twill be pleased. Now, do you have any ladies' gloves? Anger reddened Stanley's face. MacDonald knew he did not carry finery. Stanley also knew MacDonald would take his money down to the French seamstress. He considered the woman an insult to the town. A former prostitute, she did the sewing for the whorehouse floozies, and kept a supply of cheap doodads for their costumes, plus an assortment of ribbons and leather items that cut into Stanley's business. For some reason, the women from the saloons and brothels preferred her establishment. That MacDonald would even acknowledge his wife in public was another insult. Who ever heard of any other white woman living with the Comanche for two years and coming out in public places? Why couldn't she stay hid like a decent woman? None, he said as smoothly as possible. Ah, very well, then. I will need a pouch of tobacco. He turned to Lorenz and asked, Do you smoke, laddie? For once, Lorenz was polite. Yes, sir. Make that two bags of tobacco and some papers for the laddie. We will also need a loaf of bread and a pound of cheese. He looked around. And do ye have some pickles left? Yes, sir, we do. They're in the bottom of the right barrel. Y'all can fish out what all you want. Lorenz retrieved the pickles while Stanley removed the cheesecloth from the cheese and positioned the wheel over the round to hit the mark for one pound. The cleaver moved downward in one deft stroke. Will that be all? Aye, tis enough. Stanley totaled the sums, frowning and wetting his pencil stub. That comes to twenty-five dollars. "'Tis dear,' muttered MacDonald, and reluctantly counted out the money. "'The price of flour keeps going up. Sugar, too. Even if folks had jobs, they couldn't afford either one.' Bitterness was back in Stanley's voice. "'How's Schmitz doing way out there?' Not that he cared. He just wanted confirmation that the damn Yankees were caught in the same unnatural way of things since the war's end. "'Nay, well, he has carried too many on his books too long.' Stanley nodded. Somehow he couldn't gloat. What's a man to do when kids and women were hungry? He wrapped the purchases in brown paper, tied them with twine, and handed the bundles to MacDonald. Outside the sun hit full force. Dust rose in puffs and streams with every passing horse and vehicle. An undersized eight-year-old boy with snotty nose and cut-down trousers was hustling down the street, paused and asked, Be a mister? He held up an almost clean lard bucket. Aye. MacDonald tossed the boy a nickel. The brown hand shot out and clutched the coin while the boy spun on his heels and lifted them in a dead run to the saloon down the street. MacDonald handed Lorenz the packages and put down the wagon gate. He shoved the clothing and sundry items back and opened the bread and cheese, cutting both in huge slabs. Lorenz waited, his stomach lurching with the anticipation of food. He took the sandwich MacDonald made and swallowed it in huge gulps. MacDonald eyed him, sighed, and built two more sandwiches before hoisting himself up on the wagon. We might as well sit. And chew that damn thing. There tis more. He took one of the pickles and halved it neatly with his broad teeth. Lorenz flushed. The bread and cheese were hitting his stomach like lumps. But it had been a long time since he had eaten more than a mouthful of jerky. The last two days he hadn't hunted. He had not wanted Zale to know that he was near. Money he had run out of months ago. The boy came dashing back with a full bucket of beer, neatly avoiding the woman on the sidewalk. 
MacDonald handed down his own lard bucket, and the contents of the first was transferred. Air laddie, have a bite of cheese. MacDonald cut off a generous chunk and handed it to the child. Saliva drooled out of the boy's mouth. Thank you all, sir. He snatched the cheese with the same alacrity as he had the coin and ran towards the freight office. Someone there might be thirsty. Lorenz took another sandwich and a pickle. This one he chewed. Don't that Stanley fellow like you? He looked at MacDonald warily, but the man had said he had a right to ask questions. To most in this town, we are nay but damn Yankees. They tried to burn us out during the war and failed. Now they can do nay. Laughter edged in MacDonald's speech, then vanished. Then, too, they are nay happy with your mother. He paused, and Lorenz looked at him. She was with the Comanche for two years, laddie. The townspeople think she should hide away like some dirty thing. The R's rolled more thickly on his tongue again. Fortunately, your mother has more sense and pride than that. However, any slurs that may be said against her in this town are my business, nay yours. Anger shook Lorenz, and he forgot to use his dialect. They wouldn't dare. They have openly dared since the first time I brought her back, said MacDonald complacently. That does not keep them from thinking. He took another hunk of cheese. Do you wish another sandwich? I reckon. A man could travel far on a full belly. They split the last of the pickles. Do ye wish some brew? MacDonald hefted the beer bucket. No, nah, I don't like it. MacDonald tipped back his head and drank heavily, and then wiped his mouth. That seems strange when your mother makes some of the best brew around. Mama makes beer? Aye, tis a receipt she and Cap have from your grandfather. Lorenz shook his head. Who the hell was Cap? There was still a lot he had to put together. Why didn't we eat at the restaurant like Rolf and his kids? Tis Mr. Rolf, laddie, reminded MacDonald. He spends his money his way, and I spend mine my way. What's laddie mean? "'Tis my way of boy, kid, or son.' MacDonald's voice was low and gruff, but sounded kind. Lorenz was beginning to think the man was a fraud. People feared him because he was huge. Sheer meanness probably wasn't in him. The problem was his size. If the man got a hold of somebody, he would do damage, mean or not. Worse, it was possible he was someone that Lorenz had heard about. "'You and Mr. Rolf.' Lorenz emphasized Mr. to see if MacDonald took offense, and didn't see the warning glint in MacDonald's eyes. When no verbal warning came, he continued, Are you all called the bear and the wolf? MacDonald chuckled. Hi, the Comanche have called us that. Where did ye hear it? In Zale's camp. Wolf. Mr. Rolf was after him. I saw him once. He was slow skinning a man. Scared the shit out of me. MacDonald lowered the beer and looked at him, not sure that he had heard the mangled English correctly. When was this? I was about seven. Seeing the puzzled look on MacDonald's face, he kept on talking. Mama Sita, that's what I called Zale's woman, kept a counting stick. At MacDonald's nod of understanding, Lorenz launched into a recital with his own brand of English. Somebody came into camp, claiming a whole parcel of folks was after Zale, and they all broke like crazy. I was off doing something, and don't recollect what, and snuck out of there. I thought I got clean away when I looked down over a bluff. Figured somebody was down there, cause I heard a horse. If and they was after Zale, I thought they might take me home. Anyways, I just looked over and there was one dead horse, and two of Zale's men, just as dead. Another of his men was tied down over the dead horse, and the wolf, I mean, Mr. Rolf, was purring away, real slow like. Like came out as like. The man was part injun, so he weren't screaming. But I ran back towards where camp had been. Rolf didn't seem no different from Zale and his men. At least I knowed them. Mama Sita was looking for me, and took me back with her. We both got a beating that night. MacDonald set the empty lard bucket down. Tis a shame you ran. 
Friend Rolf would nae have harmed ye, as he kenned your mither and uncle were even then. Ye would have been safely home within a week. He reached for the cans of peaches and milk. The laddie's face showed nae emotion. However, dinna mention the skinnin' to young James. He held up the two cans. Have you tried these? Deftly, he used his knife to open the peaches and put two slits into the canned milk. Lorenz shook his head now. The sudden spurt of confidence had spurred him into gabbing like a jaybird. He was confused, but this time with himself. He watched MacDonald slap two peach halves, each on two slices of bread, and then empty the milk into the juice of the peach can. What the hell does canned mean, he thought. Node? He accepted a peach-crowned slice of bread, using his hands to keep the fruit from sliding off, and gulped half of the bread. The jolt of sugar hit his taste buds. God, that was good. He took a swig of the milk, sweetened juice, and nearly gagged. He hadn't tasted milk since he was, what, seven? Eight? MacDonald's huge paw grasped the can before he dropped it from his hand. Nay so fast to be rid of it, laddie. Laughter skirted the edge of his voice, and Lorenz flushed. I wish some, too. He tilted his head and downed half the liquid, finished chewing the crust in his mouth, offered the can to Lorenz, and at his refusal, downed the last of the can. It makes a tolerable pudding, he said with a grin. Milk's for babies, Lorenz protested. MacDonald's shoulders shook, the breadth of them straining against his shirt. Laddie, the Union men thanked the good Gar for that invention he said as he pointed to the empty milk can. Lorenz ignored him and watched the stragglers moving on the plank sidewalk. The Rolf family approached, ten-year-old James scooting in front, then dropping back, his head working like a swivel under his brown hat, gooseberry eyes taking in everything, his nose working almost as fast as a hound dog on a trail, and his legs jerking like sticks as he skittered in one direction, then the other, never far enough to provoke Papa Rolf to wrath. Martin lifted a hand in greeting and disappeared into the dry goods store. Rolf handed James a coin and watched his youngest charge after the older. Und mind your manners! With that bit of fatherly advice, Rolf walked to the wagon. I sent the boy for some beer. I'll buy to a drink, friend Mac. Thank you, friend Rolf. It was the easy banter of men who spent long hours in each other's company. To Lorenz, he said, Laddie, I need to purchase your mither a gift. Ye twill remain here. He grinned at Lorenz, and then at Rolf. Try nay to hurt him if he bolts. I would like to take him to his mither in one piece. Cold blue eyes swept over Lorenz. Don't worry, Rolf spat. I may drink your beer if to take too damn long. He leaned against the tailgate and folded his arms across his chest. Lorenz remained where he was. He knew Rolf would nail him with the bowie knife if he were dumb enough to run. He watched MacDonald's wide form rock down the planks and enter a small store at the end of the block. He was puzzled again. What kind of man bought a gift for his woman? Zale hadn't ever given his woman anything but a bunch of stillbirthed kids and beatings. Red never gave the women that worked in his brothels anything, and that fellow he worked for when he was twelve, and swamping out the livery stable in Tucson, never said anything about buying his woman a gift. The snot-nosed kid dashed up with another pail of beer, and Rolf held the empty for filling. Then the kid ran off for the freight depot again. He knows where his customers are in the heat of the day, thought Lorenz. He could see James hopping up and down inside the store, impatiently waiting for Martin to make his selection and pay Stanley. The guy in the store sure knew where the money was, and it weren't no kid. Rolf swigged at his beer and then shot Lorenz a glance. Do thirsty, he offered. Lorenz shook his head. That Baptist preacher he heard once must have been right. The Dutch could drink all day and think nothing of giving it to their kids. He wondered if he should say something about the slow skinning and thought the better of it. Martin stepped out of the store, a grin cutting across his face. He swaggered over to the wagon and opened his package for them to see. Now, by golly, I've got a shirt for when the pastor comes, or we have doings in town. The white, collarless shirt lay on the brown wrapping, stiff and unnatural in its folded pleats. The next time we come here, I'll buy the collar to go with it, he finished. 
What's wrong with the shirts Olga sews? asked his father. They're always the same, either blue like this one, or red flannel for winter. I get tired of it. Martin glanced at Lorenz. Olga sews real good. She just don't know what a young man needs. She still thinks I'm ten years old. He rewrapped the shirt and scooted up on the wagon bed to put the package in the same box MacDonald had dropped his goods in. Olga's my sister. He finished by slamming the lid down and dropping to the ground by his father. Young James came flying out of the store, a paper bag firmly clenched in one sun-tanned hand, and the other hand holding his hat against a sudden breeze. He clambered up beside Lorenz, his jaws furiously working at a taffy ball inside his mouth. He made a show of setting the bag between himself and the wagon. Rolf ignored them and continued drinking. "'What you got, James?' asked Martin with a wink at Lorenz. "'It ain't,' started James. Don't say it ain't, admonished Rolf. Isn't for you, finished James. It's all mine. Who, what a fine Christian you all are. Y'all won't even share with your brother, taunted Martin. I'll bet y'all don't even save one for Olga. James flushed. The taunt about not being a Christian upset him. I saved a penny for the collection plate when Pasta comes, and maybe I'll save a candy for Olga, but just her. Besides, you still got money. Lorenz picked up the empty peach can with the drops of the juice and milk pudding in the bottom. He knew James was being teased, but he couldn't figure out who the pastor fellow was. He sounded important to these people. And why wasn't James supposed to say ain't? He figured they were talking English, but the elder Rolf's English wasn't making much more sense than MacDonald's brand of speech. He made a show of drinking the liquid and smacking his lips. Y'all want some? He asked Martin. Martin's blue eyes lit up. He made sure James saw the peaches stamped on the can, threw back his head, and pretended to drink. By damn, that's good. He too smacked his lips. Uncle went and put some milk in it. He grinned at James. I'll bet Lorenz will trade you for some of the candy. Green envy fought on James's face, twisting the features and lighting up his eyes with hope. Then determination stilled the desire. I'm not drinking after you two, he declared. He popped a red ball in his mouth and worked it as deliberately as he had the taffy. Besides, if Uncle Mac had any, it's all gone. Rolf was laughing in short snorts. And that's why he'll be a pastor some day. Do can tempt him, but by golly, he's got brains. Martin shrugged, totally unconcerned that a ten-year-old had refused the bait. MacDonald appeared and handed him a dainty package to Martin. For Lorenz, it was the beginning of an active dislike of the younger Rolf. Would you put that in the box, Martin? Yeah, sure, said Martin. He stood up and placed the package with the others. And ye, laddie, continued MacDonald, can join Martin up on the seat. Lorenz set his jaw, looked up at the man, and shrugged. He had lost the argument about riding Dandy earlier. He followed Martin, not noticing the disappointment on young James's face. Do I have to ride back here, Papa? asked James. Yeah, Rolf replied, as he and MacDonald pushed up the wagon gate and secured it. Mayhap you can ride with me later, MacDonald smiled at the boy. Where to first? Martin yelled. The lumber yard? Aye, MacDonald and Rolf mounted their horses, swinging out on either side of the wagon. Martin gathered the reins and snapped them. Giddy up! He shouted to the horses, and as a warning to any coming behind them. Lorenz wondered whether the two men were guarding him or the wagon. Hell, they had just sold a herd. One or both of them had money, and maybe it was in the wagon. Maybe he shouldn't be in such a hurry to leave. Martin or James ought to know where it was hid. He glanced back at James, who promptly stuck out his tongue. Gonna get you, boy, thought Lorenz. What ails him? he asked Martin, jerking his thumb back at James. Ach! He's mad because y'all've got his seat. Martin's speech would forever be a cross between the German utterances of his parents and the drawl of Texas. Hell, he can have it for all I care. He don't know that. Martin threw a quick glance at Lorenz. It's his first time to town, and the first time working with us. He was helping with driving and cooking. He wants to be real important and ride up on the seat, not in the back like a baby. Y'all spoiled that. 
How many head y'all drive in? Three hundred. Lorenz whistled. Just the three of y'all that many? Yeah, that's all it takes. We're just in town to pick up supplies. He turned the team to the left. The right side of the street was occupied by two sporting houses. A few of the women were leaning out the windows for air and to hustle business for later. Like the buildings, they badly needed to paint their pale faces attractive. Usually, whores moved from town to town or state to state, but the war had interfered with movement, and now there was no place to go and no one to send them. One buxom blonde leaned way out and waved before yelling, Hey, big...